Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to uh, another episode of our show, Bring you another really fascinating guest today, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow on many unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Cesar de la Fuente, who is a, a presidential assistant professor uh, down the road here at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, where he leads the machine biology group, uh, whose goal is ultimately to combine the power of machines and biology uh, to help prevent, detect, and ultimately treat the various infectious diseases. Uh, he has pioneered uh, the development of the first antibiotic designed by a computer uh, with efficacy in animals. He's designed algorithms for antibiotic discovery and been involved in reprogramming venoms into antimicrobials, uh, has created novel resistant proof antimicrobial and biomedical materials and invented uh, rapid low-cost diagnostics for COVID-19 and other infections. Uh, Dr. De La Fuente has a, a master's in biotech from University of Lyon, PhD uh, in microbiology and immunology from University of British Columbia. He is a uh, an NIH MIRA or Maximizing Investigator Research Award investigator. He's been recognized uh, and received over 50 awards, uh, including being recognized by MIT Technology Review uh, as one of the world's top innovators for his uh, digitizing of evolution to make better, better antibiotics. Uh, he was recently awarded the prestigious uh, Princess of Corona Prize for Scientific Research and the American Society of Microbiology Award for Early Career Applied in Biotechnology Research. Uh, he is given hundreds of invited lectures. His uh, scientific discoveries have yielded over 100 publications in numerous uh, peer-reviewed journals, and he is also the author of multiple patents. A lot of really, really exciting uh, topics to talk to him today. Uh, Dr. Cesar de la Fuente, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Hi, I write. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It's it's great. I've, I've really been looking forward to this episode. Um, I said I, I would really like to start off though by you know typically uh, as we do handing you the floor for a few minutes just to, to talk a little bit more about you and sort of the early days. If you can uh, give us a little bit more about your background of everything from uh, from where you grew up to how you developed some of the early interest in biotech and microbiome immunology, I think that'd be a great way to uh, to start things off. What we're going to be getting into. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in the northwest of Spain in a in a city called La Coruña, which is essentially uh, north of Portugal. If you keep going going up north, it's right on the coast. And so I grew up surrounded by you know uh, by the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And so I would, as a kid, I would uh, go to the beach and go around the rocks. And I was fascinated by the world world around me, and you know different. Uh, marine organisms that I would bring back home and I would dissect them and try to understand them a little bit better. Um, I was also fascinated by engineering. And uh, so early experiments that I did with my siblings was, for example, uh, try to create uh, cha uh, flying chairs. Uh, and so for many, uh, many years, I would, um, I would ask uh, Santa Claus to bring me helium bal balloons. And I had calculated the amount of balloons that were necessary to lift the chair and with, with me or one of my siblings on it uh, so that we could fly. Uh, so we never actually achieved the number of balloons that we needed to, uh, to lift the, the amount of weight that we had. But uh, even though we were pretty small back then. Um, but anyway, so I've, I've always been fascinated. I mean, I remember also like going around and uh, capturing geckos and uh, trying to understand how their how their tails regenerated so quickly. And of course, 
when they when they get rid of the tail, there's just a defense mechanism, right? So they can uh, escape predators. Yeah. But I mean, I was just essentially fascinated by the natural world and also by engineering and how with our own hands and our ingenuity, we could create things that are fascinating, like, for example, flying objects or, you know, other things like that. And, and, and so that was me as a kid. I also love sports. So I've always, uh, you know, played soccer and then later on basketball. Uh, and, and I've always loved learning. And so reading books and learning from other people and uh, trying to always sort of uh, uh, close the gaps in knowledge that I had and to try to understand the world around me. And then after that, you know, I went to school, I studied uh, biotechnology um, uh, in Spain. And then after that, I went to, like you mentioned, to do a, a PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of British Columbia. Um, um, I was very lucky to go there. I didn't really have a plan B. Like now I see all the new generations that they have a plan B and C and D <laughs> and E and F. For me, I just, I was lucky to get accepted into the program there and I just went with it. And after that, uh, I had a fantastic time in Vancouver uh, doing my PhD with, uh, with a great mentor, uh, Robert Hancock or Bob Hancock, sure. uh, a pioneer in the field of uh, on antimicrobials and bacterial pathogenesis. And then I was uh, lucky enough to, to be able to go to MIT to do my postdoc. Um, uh, and uh, again, with, with Tim Liu there, a fantastic time. And uh, yeah, always learning from other people around me, honestly, uh, both in my own, in my labs, the labs where I was in, and also just in those environments, you know, tremendously fantastic universities, you know, UBC and then MIT. Um, and, and after that, I was recruited here at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, where I am now, and uh, also, you know, a top institution uh, worldwide, where in my lab, like you mentioned, I, I tried to combine everything that I've learned along my path, you know, microbiology, synthetic biology, computational biology, chemistry, all together uh, to try to go after some of the main goals or missions that we have, that we have as a lab. And for that, I'm lucky uh, to be surrounded by brilliant individuals um, that come uh, from all over the world. Uh, and also not only geographically speaking, they're diverse, but they also bring extremely diverse perspectives into the way we think about science, you know, because we have in lab chemists, we have synthetic biologists, we have physicists and computer scientists, and they all think about things differently. And I yep. think that's, uh, that's a fantastic way of, of, uh, of going after some of the, the issues that we're trying to go after. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad you're here in Philadelphia uh, doing this because it truly is uh, is pioneering work. I'm glad you're you're putting Philadelphia on the map for for other for other things in the area of uh, uh, of this machine biology discipline that uh, that you're creating. So this this is really exciting um, uh, personally for me sitting <laughs> sitting here in downtown Philadelphia. Um, mm -hmm. But Sarah, you know, continue along that before we get into some of the uh, the different programs. Could you just take us into, I mean, you sort of, you know, I looked at this broad definition um, of machine biology uh, that was out there. And, and, you know, you talked about interdisciplinary before, you know, a part of machine biology, as you say, is synthetic biology. And I was thinking, I've done shows on synthetic biology where they say, well, this is an interdisciplinary thing. In your case, you take synthetic biology, you're wrapping it up with chemistry, microbio, artificial intelligence biophysics, uh, other things. Talk a little bit about the term machine biology in general, so we get a general understanding of how interdisciplinary this is and what you're really doing here. Yeah, absolutely. And just to digress a little bit, but I mean, Philadelphia has only been, has has always been a, 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 a place of innovation, right? Yeah. I, Benjamin Franklin in the 1700s, and and so it's you know it's it's really a a great city to innovate and we're seeing it now with Silicon Valley you know people call it Silicon Valley because of the cell uh, cell and gene therapy innovations that have come out of here yeah. and to that we have to include the mRNA technology that was also pioneered yeah. here at the University of Pennsylvania um, by uh, Drew Weisman and Kathy Carico so anyway I'm we're we're in a fantastic city to to innovate and to do great science. Uh, but yeah, so machine biology, uh, going back to your question, the way I see science moving forward, and even today, uh, not just into the future, it's, I, I see it as a transdisciplinary uh, 
thing, you know, we're transcending disciplines. I think, you know, physicists no longer just do physics and mathematicians no longer do math and chemists no longer do just chemistry. But I, I feel like we need to learn from each other, right? The chemists need to learn from the computer scientists and the computer scientists need to learn from the microbiologists. And in order to tackle big questions and um, you really need everybody, you can't do it alone. The chemist cannot do it alone. The physicist cannot do it alone. So really, it need everybody in the room to think about some of these complex issues that we can we can talk about later. One of them is antibiotic resistance. One yeah. of the the issues that really uh, we worry about, and you know, we can't be uh, we can't be so naive anymore. We can't tackle these issues by ourselves. So we need uh, expertise from that trans transcend our own discipline. And really touch upon all these other things, and uh, and so machine biology captures some of that ethos, some of that essence of uh, you know, in order to tackle some of these big global health problems or global problems that we have as a society, uh, we need to bring everybody in the room, and we need to be able to translate each other's uh, way of thinking, uh, each other's way of communicating, uh, the way people you know. Uh, think about problems and see problems and 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 to be able to translate sort of, sort of the way chemists think into the way physicists think and so on so that both ways right so that they mm -hmm. each understand each other uh again to be able to have fun and 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 provide solutions to to some of these problems awesome awesome um let's go into some of the um the different baskets uh that you're focusing on in, in the portfolio and they're all I, I find each one equally, if not more fascinating than the other, but I'd love to start off with actually two. Uh, one um, labeled convergence discovery, and, and then the second part of that's sort of the artificial antibiotics. Uh, and you, in this area, I, I looked at some of your, your papers um, in PubMed, and you're performing, um, you know, what broadly referred to as bioprospecting, and, you know, what, thinking back in the history of sort of the antibiotic space, right, we have a lot of the antibiotics from 100 years ago that come from the fungal and microbial communities, you're sort of moving up the chain. Uh, I've seen you publish on bamboo, uh, on scorpion and wasp venoms, um, other aspects of, of, of the proteomes of, of different species. Um, and, and, you know, um, once again, we, we talked a little about this in the past, whether we're talking about venoms or some of the things that uh, invertebrates secrete or the phytoalexins the plants make, really an untapped domain uh, for, in this case, antimicrobial discovery. Talk a little bit about sort of the bioprospecting part of this, which, you know, it, it, it brings back sort of those visions. I mean, when I was back in, in the pharmaceutical world, we did have teams that <laughs> at yeah. one point that went off to nature, uh, but then you're bringing in the artificial side of this, how we then use that information to create synthetic peptides and other moieties uh, to create these antibiotics. Talk a little bit through this story, if you would. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, certainly, Ira. So, so, so I think, yeah, I think this is fascinating, right? We've, so the first antibiotic that was ever discovered was penicillin, right? That was in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. As you mentioned, he discovered it in a fungus uh, that happened to produce penicillin to protect itself from uh, invading bacteria, right? And so that was discovered in 1928. It was not really implemented in our society until, until Second World War in the 40s. So really, we've been using antibiotics for less than 100 years in our society. And, and the thing is that since the discovery of penicillin, we've always relied, really primarily relied on nature to provide us with, solu with chemical solutions for the antibiotic crisis. Yeah. And so essentially, every antibiotic that we have in hospitals, in, in the pharmacy, has, is derived from nature, from the biological world. Mm -hmm. The problem that we face now is that for decades, the scientific community, we've been unable to find a novel scaffolds, chemical scaffolds in nature that we can use as antibiotics. And so what, uh, what we're trying to do in the lab is instead of relying on nature as a source of inspiration of these beautiful life-saving drugs and molecules is, you know, how about we take advantage of the current state of compute power and our ability to generate data so that then computers can actually take care of the discovery process and they can learn how to 
you know, design and discover novel antibiotic entities. And in order to do this, we need to do, you know, the analogy that I like to use is very simplistically, we need to, um, we need to teach computer to, basically we need to translate the chemical complexity of molecules, right? Into the binary code of ones and zeros. So the computer can understand what we're talking about in terms of this molecule means this, and this other molecule means that. So the computer needs to be able to understand. The second thing that the computer needs to learn is to, to read molecules. Uh, once it can read, it can read them anywhere. So if you give if you give the molecule if you give the computer a proteome, uh, which is a, an assembly of proteins, or a genome, which is a, a conjunction of genes um, from a particular organism, to read, then the computer can read molecules in that biological information. And then the third step is writing. And so writing is actually creating uh, new molecules. And, and this uh, brings about a little bit of an aspect of creativity onto computers, which we, we, know, uh, uh, we typically associate with the human brain, uh, but we are making um, a bit of progress and really training computers to be able to create new things. And so that element of creativity is being transferred onto, onto machines now. And so really it's like, if you imagine a little kid and you need to teach the little kid how to understand the world, how to read and how to write, that's, uh, that's really, uh, we're at those initial stages of, of trying to teach that to a machine. And, um, and that's why it's an exciting field. Uh, it's extremely young. Uh, if you look at publications, <clears throat> at the intersection between AI and antibiotic discovery in particular, we did a retrospective study and until the year 2018, there were really no, not a lot of publications in PubMed uh, at this intersection. So it's a, it's a field that is at its infancy and, and it's an extremely exciting field. Whenever I have an opportunity to, to be uh, talking to an audience, such as your audience here in the podcast, I always encourage if there, if there are any young minds uh, in the audience that are from many from any field almost any scientific or engineering field that are interested in a problem that is of global importance and uh, of health uh, you know a health problem uh, and are interested in you know spending their time and energy on something worthwhile that the world needs I, I always try to encourage them to to join our efforts in trying to um, you know come up with new antibiotics by means of AI and computers it's a um... It, it it is an unmet. I mean, it's it's a shame once again that it's it's become and they said this unmet need uh, in 2022. And you know, we were just a, a couple episodes ago. We we talked with the the Carbex people up at Boston University. Uh, you know, talking about the issue. Um, when when you I, I know that you started to uh, you know you've been testing some of these uh, novel peptides and so forth in, in different uh, in vitro and animal model systems. Uh, one of the, the things that it was always interesting to me when I hung out in, in the natural product world is that um, whether it was the plants or, or some of these other species, they were very good at making uh, these libraries of substances that did different things. They, I guess they evolution taught them, you know, don't just make one antibiotic to, to kill off this stuff, try to make uh, different combinations. And I'm just interested, aside from uh, the uh, the antibiotic potential of some of these peptides. Um, any interesting, and maybe it's too early to know, or if it's confidential, that's fine. But um, <laughs> there's this whole area of sort of antivirulence as well in this space that you know we don't want to kill this thing, but we want to make the bacteria kind of like you know like quorum sensing and all that. We, we don't make the bacteria uncomfortable, so they right. go do something else or whatever. Any interesting modes of action that you're running into as you start to study some of these novel moieties in, in the in vitro review systems? Yeah, those are some interesting thoughts. So we haven't done a ton of work with uh, antivirulence compounds, yeah. uh, but I'm happy to talk about it. I think it's fascinating. So, so virulence factors are uh, little uh, molecules that bacteria generate and secrete that make them more virulent. What that means is that they make them more harmful uh, against humans. Um, and so one, one of the things that they produce is quorum sensing molecules that allow different bacteria to communicate, to talk to each other, to make each other stronger against, you know, in, in, in this case, in, in, if, it's in, if they're in our host, if they've invaded ourselves, a human body. So it's, it's, it's a lot harder for the human body, for our immune system to get rid of them. And uh, so there are different groups around the world developing um, uh, 
molecules that target quorum sensing systems mm -hmm. to prevent bacteria from talking to each other. So then it's a lot easier to clear them with conventional antibiotic therapies. That's one example. Um, there are other types of virulence factors that bacteria produce and secrete that uh, seem make just make them more uh, more dangerous. And uh, and people have come up with different uh, clever tricks to to have molecules that sequester those virulence factors, for example, and deactivate them in a way, and 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 so on. But in our case, I mean, we've um, we've definitely uh, become uh, quite intrigued by venoms, for instance. So venoms are an underexplored source of potential drugs, including yeah. antibiotics. We typically associate venoms with bad things that uh, that are harmful to us. Uh, but venoms are incredibly complex um, uh, substances that contain a lot of potential uh, bioactive molecules. And so we've, we've looked into a number of them and we've found uh, uh, antimicrobial molecules in them that we've then explored further. Uh, uh, and we've identified molecules with antimicrobial properties, like I mentioned, but also immunomodulatory properties. And we've developed those further in the lab um, and the, what I think is really cool is that they allow us not only to treat infections in the conventional way, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you have an antimicrobial molecule that targets the bacterium, you destroy the bacterium and you get rid of the infection. But an immunomodulatory molecule, what it can do is it can indirectly treat infections by boosting our own immune system. Mm -hmm. So then our own immune system is able to clear the infection. So we're not targeting directly the microbe or the pathogen, but we're targeting our own immune system. Mm -hmm. and we're enhancing it uh, so that it can it can fight off the infection. It's very exciting, really exciting stuff. What um, you know, speaking of uh, a microbe, so you know, you're looking at you know, your bioprospecting in these, I say the uh, these higher level organisms from the plants, the the invertebrates, the insects, and so forth. But you're also very active in in, in the in the microbiome as well. Um, and you know, this has become an extremely hot topic. Whether we're talking about the gut uh, or the the skin microbiome or all the other microbiomes that we have, um, and then you point out in in your materials that. Uh, Microbiome communities very complicated. There are you know trillions of things that live in us, uh, viruses, microbes of all sorts. Uh, we're really just you know beginning to understand not just what's there, but also uh, how these systems uh, interplay with one another. Whether it's the immune system, you focus as well on the nervous system and potential uh, connections with the microbiome. Talk a little bit about what you're doing here in terms of understanding. Um, the complexity of the microbiome, but also engineering it uh, sort of as a, these living microbial cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I agree with you. I think the microbiome is a fascinating field of, of science and research and engineering. Uh, it's, we're essentially surrounded by microbes, both on literally our surfaces are surrounded by microbes and uh, inside our bodies where we're also completely colonized by microbes. But the vast majority of them are, are beneficial. So they help us digest our food, the ones in our, in our intestines, they enhance our health, they prevent disease and so on. And so they're incredible little creatures that are actually uh, have co-evolved with us uh, through you know, millions of years. And they've, we've essentially learned how to live with them and they help us out and we help them out by providing a, a good house with a good temperature where they can thrive and, and, and divide and, and be happy. And so one, one of the things that we've, that we're trying to do in my lab is so traditionally, particularly, particularly the gut microbiome has been associated with a lot of diseases from, yeah. uh, you know, cancer, obesity, neurodegenerative disorders, anything you can imagine, you know, all these disorders that are devastating diseases, right. That kill many, 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 many thousands of, if not millions of people every single year in the world. However, most of those associations have been correlational, okay. um, but not a lot of causation or causal studies where really the investigators demonstrate that a particular microbe or set of, of gut microbes are causing a particular disease. And I think the gap there is that we currently don't have uh, tools that allow us to you know, engineer or reprogram microbial communities in such a way that we can interrogate 
uh, how they're influencing disease. And one way of thinking about this is you can develop a technology that might be uh, able to knock out specific members within a community. Let's say they have a community with bacteria, bacteria A, B, C, and D, and you want to be able to understand whether any of those are causing a particular disease X. Mm -hmm. So if you have a technology that allows, it, allows you to knock out, let's say bacteria A, but not any of the other ones, mm -hmm. you can interrogate whether bacteria A is actually the causative agent of that particular disease. And you can okay. then do that with B, with C, with D and F, E and F, et cetera, right? This is a little bit, the, the analogy would be like, uh, you know, how we use gene knockouts sure. to understand the structure and function of, of a particular gene. But here you would understand uh, the structure of, and function of a particular uh, gut commensal or a, or a particular microbe within a complex disease. And uh, so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to develop technologies that are uh, allow, would allow us to delete specific members and then ask the question of whether those members are are, are costly are related to to particular diseases. Yeah, but it's a difficult problem. Is that you know developing such a technology is, it, it has numerous challenges. Um, that you know, I could enumerate. One of them is that uh, gut bacteria uh, is difficult to grow them together. Yep. Uh, so the scientific community is still trying to figure out how to do that um, and how to do that in a in a in a robust way over time. And so that's just one of the many many challenges that that lie ahead in this field. But it's again another very exciting field that I think is in in need of of novel technologies at this stage. And I think once we develop those technologies, I think it's going to, to go into the next uh, sort of like the 2.0, microbiome 2.0, or however you want to think about it. Excellent. When we think of the microbiome now, obviously we're thinking of you know, these living cocktails of, of, of microbes. And that um, actually le leads me into um, another part of your platform, which is, you know, broadly described as living medicines. Um, and, and once again, here are some uh, themes that we've had in the past. We've talked about things like bacteriophage uh, therapy as, a, you know, a, a novel area of, uh, of potential antimicrobial uh, administration. Um, we've talked a little bit about the um, these sort of, you know, sort of these good viruses. You, you were mentioning some of that, some of them that well, a lot of them are good. Um, and we we talked uh, at one point about something called hepatitis G, which had this weird uh, way of making us more resistant to herpes. In fact, and, and and once again, it comes back to this whole area of immunomodulation and some of the things you were talking about. Um, once again, your your living medicine portfolio is quite fascinating and broad. You're looking at things like um, sort of turning microbes into little pharmacy factories to produce therapeutic molecules for us. Uh, at the same time, you talk about living biotherapeutics. We've we've seen a little bit of this in in, in the recent years on, on sort of using. Uh, some bad bugs that we think of bad, things like salmonella, but using them for other purposes like in cancer therapy and so forth. What are some of your goals in terms of living medicines? If you could talk about that. Yeah, certainly. I think the concept there is that uh, instead of delivering a drug in the, in the conventional way, which is, you know, you take the drug and there's nothing smart about it. You could instead engineer uh, living organisms that are beneficial, such as, mm -hmm. you know, uh, probiotic bacteria, such as the ones that we have in yogurt. Right. We have thousands of different probiotic microbes in yogurt every time we, we, we take a scoop of yogurt. So why not engineer those in the laboratory in a way that they, they encode and they produce a particular therapeutic? And they, like you mentioned, these probiotics would essentially act as factories for the production of that particular biotherapeutic. So you could then take them in yogurt in the morning, right? Those engineer microbes, they would go through your stomach. They would reach your gut, for example. They would colonize your gut. And then in real time, they would be dividing your gut and they would be producing a particular therapeutic that could help you, let's say, resolve a gut inf an intestinal infection or something like that. And uh, But that's just one example. So the idea is um, that you, could, you can engineer uh, smart, uh, uh, microbes that could produce biotherapeutics. They could also sense biomarkers indicative of particular disorders. Mm -hmm. And and upon sensing such biomarkers, they would be able to then release a biotherapeutic. 
And so these are like sense and response um, s- sort of um, systems mm-hmm. that are that are essentially smart, right? Because you don't need to wait uh, to really have any symptoms even prior uh, to to pr- to having any perception of symptoms. Uh, these microbes could sense uh, that ahead of time, and so those are some of the some of the things that we're that we're sort of thinking about. It's still very early stages. Again, there uh, as of today, I don't think there are any biotherapeutics or engineer microbes that are having approved by the FDA. I know the FDA are looking into it, but of course there are a number of or safe, safety and, and ethical uh, hurdles that need to be uh, you know they need to be sort they need to be sorted out, and that takes time and to ensure that uh, that everything uh, is done properly. And so again, uh, still a very early stage sort of uh, uh, research field, but but also very exciting. And I think with a uh, with a bright future. Yeah, I agree with you. And hey, it's it's uh, you know the fact that the FDA is beginning to uh, work with and, and provide guidance for these things that don't look like our drugs of yesterday, <laughs> that aren't yeah. just small molecules or proteins is a great sign for when ultimately your stuff comes through into the clinic, there's gonna be a pathway there um, for it. So it, it, it's extremely exciting uh, work. Um, is it, can you say a few words about, um, I know you published last year uh, in it was, um, Nano uh, about your low cost biosensors for COVID. Uh, I think the paper low cost optic diagnostic for minute, minute time scale detection of SARS-CoV-2. Um, if you could just say a, a few words about that work, just because I want to point that out as well um, as something that you've done. But also, um, and, and I, you know, I don't know how much this could be related to the technologies developed. But one of the other really cool themes that we've been uh, having quite a few guests come on and mention is this. Um, uh, principle of one health uh, that's out there that you know uh, we we got hit by a nasty um, virus a couple of years ago and there's undoubtedly other bad stuff out there that might be headed our way. Um, can you talk just in general about some of this, these biosensing tools and some of the potential you see for um, as everyone was saying we need more vaccines, more antivirals, and we need a lot, a lot of new biosensing. Um, what, what do you see as the potential for some of this technology? If you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. So, so basically, prior to the pandemic, we we're working on biosensors and diagnostic technologies for bacterial infections, mostly. And of course, in March of 2020, everything changed. The whole world absolutely collapsed, and we were faced with, uh, you know, a historical uh, pandemic. And so, you know, in my lab, we we sort of felt a sense of responsibility to try to contribute, even intellectually. Uh, uh, or technologically to 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 the pandemic, and so we started, uh, we pivoted some of the things that we're doing for bacterial infections to detect bacteria, uh, to in this case detect SARS-CoV-2, and we were able to, uh, in collaboration with fantastic people here in the lab and and other colleagues uh, colleagues elsewhere, we were able to develop three prototypes uh, for rapid detection and low cost detection of COVID-19. One of which is the one that you mentioned that was published in, in the journal ACS Nano. Uh, that one was an optodiagnostic. Um, so what that means is, so we use nanotechnology to, we essentially engineered a cotton swab that was functionalized with ACE2. Okay. And so just let me take this, uh, one step back. Please. Uh, so the virus SARS-CoV-2, um, when it enters our bodies, uh, on its surface, it has a protein uh, called the, the spike protein or, uh, you know, S protein uh, that acts as an antigen. What that means is that when it enters our bodies, our body is going to recognize that antigen or that spike protein as a foreign element. And our body is going to mount an immune response to try to counteract it. So the virus has come with the spike protein enters our bodies. And then in a lot of our, bo- in a, in a lot of our cells, we have a receptor called ACE2. And the spike protein will bind to ACE2. So that's what happens essentially. It's spike protein binds to ACE2. And that's how the infection process begins. Mm-hmm. So that is a natural process, but which humans get infected by the virus. Okay. So we've essentially recapitulated that on a cotton swab. So the cotton swab we functionalize with ACE2. And in a, in a test tube, if you have a sample uh, that can be, you know, it's a, it's a nasal sample. If it contains the virus, 
the virus through the spike protein is going to bind to H2, mm-hmm. and then through a, a physical event that is called a plasmonic, the plasmonic effect, the color of the cotton swab is gonna sh- is gonna shift to a different color if the virus is present. So it's a little bit like um, like a pregnancy test mm-hmm. uh, where you know whether you're pregnant or not through a color change. This uh, operates at the same level where you know whether you're infected with the virus or not uh, through through a color change. And it's a, it's a minute scale detection. So it takes several minutes and it, it's really low cost. So it's only 15 cents per, per cotton swab. And uh, which, which is something that we paid a lot of attention. We really wanted to create technologies in lab uh, or prototypes that were low cost, you know, so that anybody could afford them, not only people with money, but, uh, but also thinking about uh, low research settings or developing countries or, uh, or, or places where people don't have the means to, to buy expensive tests. And, uh, and the other thing is that, so this is a colorimetric test, right? You get your results for a color change, but we've been using a free app um, that allows us to actually quantify the pixel intensity so we can then quantify the signal. And we've been able to correlate the signal with um, CT values from PCR. So mm-hmm. and it correlates very well, not only for um, viral like samples with uh, high levels of virus, but also median levels and low low levels. So that was pretty exciting to see. Very exciting. So one um, one thing I, uh, I I missed at the beginning. I want to just c- come back to it real fast while I have you because I I was really intrigued by this one, and it, it again comes back to the um, the first topic we talked about the uh, the antibiotics and conversion discovery. But just a, a couple of months ago, you published um, a paper, uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering, uh, entitled Mining for Encrypted Peptide Antibiotics in the Human Proteome. Could you mm-hmm. talk for just a couple of minutes about what that, because my basic understanding of it is that we have, obviously peptides can do more than one thing, but is this in essence saying that we have novel antimicrobial peptides like some of these other species that we have not discovered. Well, what are what are encrypted peptides all about? If you could talk for a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, so traditionally, we've lacked, I think, tools to be able to discover novel antimicrobials in information that we have in front of our eyes. You know, our own genome, our own right. proteome. It's information that we've had, you know, for many years now. And uh, so, what we've done here to to try to discover novel peptide antibiotics in this case. In, in the human body is we've developed a, uh, an, an algorithm that operates a little bit like a, um, like a, like a pattern recognition algorithm, mm-hmm. similar to the ones that we use for image and speech recognition on like Siri, Alexa, and all of that to recognize facial expressions or sounds. But instead of recognizing that here, we wanted to recognize molecular patterns in genomes and proteomes. Got it. So the analogy here would be like, if you have a huge Word document of hundreds of pages, you know, a PhD thesis or something, and you wanted to find a particular word within the document, for example, Philadelphia, you would go to the search function, you would type Philadelphia, and the algorithm finds the word Philadelphia in every instance that it appears in the huge Word document, right? Okay. So the algorithms that we've developed in collaboration with colleagues uh, in, in Italy they act like the search function in Word. So mm. we know what we're looking for, the word Philadelphia. Again, we're looking, we're looking at other type of code, right? It's not, it's not letters like that. It's, so in the case of genomes, AC, uh, Gs, and, and Cs, in the case of the proteome, we're looking at the, at the different amino acids. Got it. Uh, but we know what we're looking for. And then the algorithms operate like a search function that allows us to find those molecules within Instead of a Word document, we use entire databases of genomes and proteomes. But in, 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 it's the same thing, essentially, it's text, right? Got it. And um, so utilizing this concept, we were able to, to explore the entire human body, uh, the proteome, um, for peptide antibiotics. And we, the, the really exciting thing from my perspective is that we've been able to find them not only in the immune system, where it's the system where you would envision you would find things that 
counteract pathogens that Got invade it. us. But we also found them in the nervous system, cardiovascular, digestive systems. And now we have this hypothesis in the lab where uh, we think that immunological response may not only be a thing of the immune system, but it might be a more holistic approach where all our other body systems are directly or indirectly contributing to uh, to fighting off uh, invading organisms. And um, so, yeah, now we're, we're, we're expanding this work. We're trying to use similar algorithms to find antibiotics in, in different uh, sources of data that have uh, not previously been explored. We're looking at extinct organisms and other things. That's, that's, uh, that's incredible. It, it kind of reminds me, I, I think last year we were talking to some folks about, uh, you know, we talk about amyloid and Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. but you know, that these amyloids, they have other uses, like right. sopping up microbes and so forth. And the right side, now that's, I, I'm finally now making the connection back. And, and now <laughs> you, you've enlightened us. <laughs> They're really, really fascinating. I mean, I, it's, just, it's an amazing set of programs. And I just, I, I'm, I'm so looking forward to continuing uh, to, to watch how all this progresses. Uh, and as I said, I'm, 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 I'm glad you're here in Philadelphia doing the work, putting us on the map for this. Um, anything else? hot for 2022, 2023 that you want to mention while I have you. I mean, I try to touch on all the, the core components, but if there's anything else that I missed, please take the floor. Any other messages sure. that you want to, uh, to send out there? Sure. So, so I forgot to, to talk about the One Health concept. So, yeah. uh, so, so One Health is essentially the notion that every, every ecosystem is connected. So the environment yep. with animals, with humans, we're all connected. And so when antibiotics are, are spilled into a river, uh, that's gonna, you know, that's gonna affect the fish that are in the river that we then are going to eat. And so those, if any antibiotic resistance in, is developed throughout that process, that is going to get transmitted uh, from the environment into animals, into humans, and 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 so on. So it's like a circle. Uh, it's all it's all sort of interconnected, and that's how antibiotic resistance oftentimes can get transmitted um, uh, throughout the environment. Um, I just want to highlight that antibiotic resistance is a global health problem. Yep. Uh, it's projected to kill 10 million people every year in the world by 2050 if we don't come up with new antibiotics. And so if you do a quick calculation, that actually cor corresponds to one death every three seconds. Yeah. Uh, so it's, a, it's really a silent pandemic. Uh, we're not really talking about it that much, but it's, it is a huge problem. And and uh, and I think I I just like to to highlight a couple of things here. One of, one of them is that antibiotics are not only useful when we have an infection, and of course we treat ourselves and we get cured within a matter of hours or days, right? Uh, but they're also essential for modern medicine. So contemporary medicine would not be uh, possible without antibiotics that work. Yeah. Things like uh, childbirth, you need to yeah. have these medicines, right? Uh, organ transplantation, uh, surgeries, even minor surgeries, you need to have antibiotics that work. Um, chemotherapy treatments, cancer patients are notably immunosuppressed, immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. That means that they can easily get infected with anything that is laying around, any sort of bacterial pathogen that is laying around. And so you need antibiotics that work to cure those patients. And so that's really important to highlight. And the other thing is that, um, you know, humans, we've been able to practically double our lifespan over the last hundred years. And that is, uh, that is really thank, thanks to two main pillars, antibiotics, vaccines, and clean water. Mm -hmm. So imagine a world where one of these huge pillars no longer works. Uh, again, we're going, we're going back to a pre-antibiotic era where even a minor scratch could be a, a lethal uh, situation. And so I think it's, it's really important to take it seriously and and uh, and to really you know invest in uh, antibiotic discovery and antibiotic design to try to think outside of the box and hopefully to try to encourage uh, young minds to to join in in some of these efforts uh, again to to incorporate some of these uh, these new concepts like computer science and synthetic biology and machine biology to try to tackle uh, this this huge problem. That's it. It's an awesome message. And yeah, you're, it's a, it's so a sobering message uh, when you think about those numbers and how, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've thought of the issues that antibiotics have dealt with for the last hundred years as, as, as dealt with, but now, as you point out, um, we got some problems headed our way. So once again, I, I'm really glad that you're, 
you're focusing on this and and, and your group has such a, a diversity of programs uh, to take advantage of you know, once again what what the power of nature uh, and, and, and combined with uh, power of genomics and, and some of these cutting edge tools so really exciting um, for for everybody that is uh, going to be listening to this episode across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Cesar de la Fuente, Presidential Assistant Professor, University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, heading up their machine biology group, doing really amazing things to combine the power of machines, biology, ultimately to help protect us and detect, prevent, and treat uh, these nasty infectious diseases. Um, Cesar, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Uh, thank you for everything that you're doing there at Penn. And, and as we like to say on this show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us to what you're doing. It's a really very impressive story. Ira, thank you so much for having me. It's an, an honor uh, being able to spend this time with you and discussing science and interesting topics. And Hopefully, uh, with hard work, we can we can make uh, tomorrow's world a, a better world. So, again, thank you for the opportunity. It's been super fun. Great having you.